um, I'm your $10,000 word archaeologist. I'm actually a paleoethnobotanist, which means that almost all of my research has to do with the ways in which people and plants interact in the past. But I'm even a little stranger than that. Most of my colleagues actually study plant domestication, um, so really they're looking at food crops, which I do some of, but the bulk of my research has to do with the ways in which people are using plants for technological purposes. And so I'm going to talk today about research I've been doing for years now. Most of the material you're going to see is actually going to come from Arkansas, but a little bit of it also from Oklahoma and a little bit from Kentucky as well. So just to kind of briefly throw up here for a moment, when most people th talk about ancient textiles, they're going to think about Peru and Egypt and Chile, where we have these really unique preservation conditions. But in fact, we do have a fair amount of evidence for textiles and basketry in the southeast through a pretty substantial period of time. Some of the oldest basketry materials have been found at Windover in Florida, and they're about eight to 9,000 years old. So we've actually got a fairly deep time record for the production of fabric materials in the, in the southeast. But here in Arkansas, we have one of the single largest assemblages of well-preserved materials, including bags, clothing, shoes, food, baskets, coil baskets, interlaced baskets, and then all kinds of weird stuff that we actually don't know what they are because we don't normally get them in the archaeological record. One of the biggest reasons why I went into the research that I did was because um, I spent the better part of my childhood and young adulthood being dragged around to historic sites by my parents and museums in the southeast. I'm a child of many, many visits to many, many state parks and museums. And inevitably, you go into a museum that had stuff about archaeology of the southeast, and you would see this diorama, and it would always include some poor, benighted woman forever frozen in the most mind-numbing task you could think of. She's grinding corn, or she's scraping a hide, and she's always dressed <laughs> in this ratty, unformed, unshaped little chunk of leather wrapped around her waist. And I spent years thinking to myself, surely there were better things to wear. <laughs> I mean, we're human. We, our, our ideas about things don't really change much society to society. We like things pretty. We like things bright. We like things well made. We like things that fit us well. We're human. Um, so I, uh, I took offense <laughs> quite often to drudge on a hide. And I'll point out that drudge on the hide is actually a phrase that comes from one of my mentors to talk about the ways in which women are depicted in the past. So you're going to hear a lot about women today, which is appropriate for it being Women's Month, it's March. Um, but this is women's work, and these are women's materials. Very quickly, these are the basic weaving techniques that we see in textiles across the southeast and basketry as well. Um, mostly what I'm going to talk about today is going to be twined textiles and some of the interlaced basketry, but we do have really good examples of some of the netting as well. And oddly, we're one of the few places in the southeast where we have really good evidence for coil baskets. My research, like I said, focuses mostly on understanding what the plants are that people are using. So I spend hundreds of hours in a microscope looking at plant materials, both modern and archaeological. And what I've been able to sort of understand through the research that I do is that despite the fact that there are hundreds of plants out there that are uh, perfectly usable for fiber, people really are selecting a very specific set of plants. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But these are kind of our prime suspects. And then at the bottom there, <laughs> this is not a plant. <laughs> at the bottom there is a bunny rabbit. Um, so I started out doing just plants and realized that I was going to have to teach myself how to do some animal fur identification as well, because we do have some spun um, animal wool, animal fur textiles. And you'll notice that they range from plant fibers coming from trees to plant fibers coming from forbs, things like milkweed and dogbane, which are usually the items that most people will mention when they talk about ancient textiles. Um, but then also a plant known as Oryngium yuccifolium, or rattlesnake master, which nobody knows about, and I'll talk a little bit more. Who watches CSI? <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. So it's totally not like well, how they show in the, in the, in the show. Um, I'll 
somebody wants to ask me about this later, I can talk about how the FBI got sort of slammed for their bad science. But in doing fiber identification, an enormous amount of what I do is actually looking at cell structures of plants. Um, so I'm looking at samples that are magnified anywhere from 100 to 600 times in order to understand cell structures. And oftentimes, it's not even the fiber itself that's identifiable. It'll be all the little subsidiary things about the plant that allow me to know what genus or what species or what family of plant that the fiber source is coming from. And it gets complicated because, like I said, people are using everything from tree fibers to forbs to grasses. They're using an enormous range of materials. The example I have up here is one of my favorites. So most archaeologists will be familiar, most people will be familiar with bone awls, turkey bone awls. This is actually a little awl made from a section of, um, I believe it's a turkey ulna. But unlike most archaeologists, the stuff that I look at is still hafted. So in this case, it still has a willow bark handle wrapped around one end of it. And then the Eryngium yuccifolium, which I mentioned earlier, is a kind of an amazing and interesting fiber. It's a plant that almost nobody does anything about. It gets sort of overlooked in you know, native wildflower discussions because it's not very pretty. Um, but it turns out to be one of the single most important fiber sources for almost 8,000 years in the southeast United States. Um, and fortunately, it's also relatively easy to identify. It's got a little leaf hair, ignore the frog. Um, but the little leaf hairs persist into the archaeological material. It makes it easy for us to identify that it is, in fact, a ringium. And it is super, super important. It makes up an enormous amount of the textiles that I've analyzed. Um, we see it being used in textiles in Illinois, in Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, Arkansas, Oklahoma. Pretty much where we get well-preserved textiles, we will inevitably find something that's been made with eryngium. Um, and like I said, it has a documented 8,000-year history. So this is a really critical fiber source. And the interesting thing about it is that people are using it for this huge array of stuff. Everything from like, I, see, I get all these little <laughs> tied knots of eryngium, and it's literally thousands of just a knot out of eryngium. And I'm like, I don't entirely know what you people were doing with that. I don't know. You caught a rabbit, and you tied its feet up and carried it home, and then discarded the little knot. Um, all the way to being used to haft tools, and then being used to make bags, baskets, or uh, bags and uh, other sorts of containers, as well as robes and skirts. It's this incredibly important fiber. I'll do the like super fast chronology of textiles in the southeast. And this is, again, drawn mostly from Arkansas, but looking a little bit further out across the, the broader region. One of the really interesting things about the archaic period into the woodlands, so we're talking anywhere between six and 5,000 years ago to about 1,000 years ago, is that it is heavily, heavily involves the use of tree species. We see people using a lot of silvic fibers, what we would call silvic basts. They're also using some of the um, trees. So in this case, we're looking at a hickory split basket. Um, it is common to assume in Arkansas basketry that split hickory and split, split oak baskets are a European thing, an idea that was brought in by European um, colonial settlers. It's not. This is a split hickory basket that's almost 3,000 years old. Um, so it's a technology and a technique that native and indigenous peoples had long before Europeans showed up here. They're heavily, heavily using pawpaw tree fibers as well. And this one really interests me. Um, <laughs> ignore the alarm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what they're doing is they're actually like skinning a tree and then they roll the big rolls of bark up and submerge it into still water and let it rot for months. And what happens is that all of the extraneous cell tissue rots away and it leaves these long, beautiful, lustrous strips of fiber. It's a really gorgeous fiber material. And then they're weaving all kinds of uh, items out of it. In this particular case, this <coughs> rounded edge that you see on this textile is not a tear or a fold. It's actually an intentional um, aspect of the weave. The weaver has carefully staggered the warts to make a shaped edge. And we think this is probably the bottom of a robe, and it would have been worn around the shoulders. So even at 2,000, 3,000 years ago, we see people intentionally shaping textiles for clothing. <coughs> 
Some of my favorite there are the shoes. I mentioned earlier how important the eryngium is. In fact, almost all of the woven shoes that we have in the southeast are made with eryngium. And we have examples from Illinois, from Kentucky, and from the Ozark Plateau. And they span a pretty big period of time. The oldest shoe in the world, um, well, it's not quite the world, but one of the oldest shoes in the world actually comes from Missouri. Um, and it's about a 7,500 or 8,000 year old woven eryngium shoe. I think it might actually be up here. Nope, I don't have that one up here. Um, but you see the range of dates. So we're talking about shoes anywhere from 7,000 um, all the way up to about 2,000 years old. Probably they're used all the way up into what we would call the Mississippian period or the late prehistoric period, but we don't have radiocarbon dates for all of the shoes, so it's kind of hard to tell what the full span of time is for their use. Um, but they're pretty amazing. One of my favorite things about these shoes is they're pretty common in the Mammoth Cave system in Kentucky, and uh, if anybody wears slip-on shoes, so basically what these do is you your, your toes are in here and your heel is in here. They're like little slip-on slippers. And um, if you wear slip-on shoes, the one thing you'll do when you come home and you're going to get out of your shoes is you'll go like this and you'll pull one shoe off with the toes of your other, your other foot. When you go into the Mammoth Cave system, there are a set of these woven shoes sitting precisely like that. You actually can see where someone pulled one shoe off with one foot and then stepped back and pulled the other shoe off and went on. And they're still sitting there three to 4,000 years later in their exact position. The other kind of amazing thing about them is that there's such an immediacy of the person who wore these. Because what we'll see is the wear, uh, whoops, it is a touch screen. <laughs> what we'll see is the wear on the balls of the feet and the heel of your foot where that person's foot was wearing that shoe. So they're kind of an amazing look um, at sort of how personal um, the past can be. Moving down in the time of the woodland period, so talking between about 3,000 and 1,000 years ago, I always like to kind of show this, because especially for those of us here in Arkansas, if you've gone to Tulsa Mound, you've gone to some of the other sites, you'll know that the material culture that you see in the museums isn't necessarily the most exciting looking stuff ever. It's Gary Points and Baytown Plain ceramics. It tends to be kind of, mm, you know, pretty plain, shall we say. Um, and in fact, so plain that um, years ago, an archaeologist by the name of Stephen Williams referred to the woodland period as the Great Gray, the Great Gray Woodland Period, that it was just very plain and very simple. Well, it might have been simple in ceramics, but when you look at people's textiles, it's not so plain. In fact, they're weaving some really spectacular items. And this is also a time period when we're starting to see the increased use of river cane for river cane basketry, which indigenous weavers today still use. That's still a, a persisting tradition, and I'll show an image of that. But we'll see, you know, most of it tends to be kind of the relatively simple chevron patterns in the baskets. But we do have some pretty complicated motifs as well that are showing up. And so this little tiny basket looks much bigger than it is. It's actually a little, it's like a little sweet little miniature basket. It's only about that tall. Um, it has a radiocarbon date of 8,500 8, to 8,600. So this is a pretty um, ancient motif. And you'll see it again in a moment. Onward with the eryngium and the pawpaw, such an incredibly important set of fibers. I mean, this really is the, the primary fiber source for a really long period of time. One of the sort of interesting things that I found in looking at textiles in the Ozark Plateau is that there is this very distinctive woodland type of textile, and it's this textile right here. So what they're doing is they're using the rattlesnake master as the warps, and they're using the, the processed uh, pawpaw bark for the weft or the weaving. And this is also one of the few examples where we're starting to see the possibility that people are um, mixing and matching intentional colors. Sort of the earliest forms of dyeing might be um, part of what's going on here. But it's a really distinctive woodland textile, and there are hundreds of fragments of it. So as I was doing my research, I need to back up a second here and say a little bit about plant use in the southeast. We know from looking at some of the foodstuffs 
that beginning about 4,000 to 5,000 years ago, the people in the southeast, including here in Arkansas, were domesticating plants. We are one of 10 global centers of domestication across the world. So it's the same as looking at rice in parts of Asia, wheat and einkorn from um, the Middle East, from the Levant. We're a global center of domestication here in Arkansas and across the southeast. And what they're domesticating are these little tiny seeded plants. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with quinoa, but quinoa is quinopodium quinoa. And here in the southeast United States, indigenous peoples domesticated a plant that we know as quinopodium berleriandi. It's a <coughs> wild, it's a weed basically in most people's gardens. Most people pull it, it's actually edible. Um, so we know that they're domesticating these tiny seeded, tiny, tiny little seeded um, plant materials. And we actually get some pretty impressive examples of that. So we see late archaic quinopodium seeds being stored in bottle gourds. This little thing right here is like the funniest artifact I've ever seen in my life. It's like a charcoal briquette about this size. It is a mass of quinopodium seeds uh, burned into a one big mass of charcoal, but it has the exact shape of the leather bag that they were in. So you can actually see the like puckering up the side where they stitched the little leather bag up and then the drawstring where it was pulled tight at the top. Archaic period textiles, so at a, when we're looking at a period prior to plant domestication, the weaves are much more open. So perfectly good for carrying some acorns, for carrying hickory, for carrying some of the other types of materials that people are eating. But when we get to these little tiny seeded plants, this is not going to work. These have issues. And if you store food, you'll know why. You probably don't want to store dry seed in a tightly sealed container because it'll rot inside of there. You actually do want a little bit of airflow when you're storing seed so that they don't rot in place. Well, store it into a leather bag, store it into a bottle gourd, you've got some issues. For years, this bag, which actually was on exhibit here at the State House for a while, um, was out of reach of my ability to do any research on it because it was loaned to one institution and then to another and it'd be an exhibit and I would never be able to actually like, get to it to analyze it. And it recently came back to the University of Arkansas Museum where it's curated and I had an opportunity to look at it in person. For years, I have always wondered if this bag was in fact one of these types of textiles, the syringium and pawpaw. And oh my, yes it is. It absolutely is. And it is one of the most beautifully woven examples of one of these types of textiles. It's just a gorgeous little bag. The pictures make it seem like it's big. It's not. It's a very sweet little thing. It's about this big. It holds a liter of domesticated quinopodium seeds. And in fact, it's so well woven that 2,000 years later, it still holds a liter of domesticated quinopodium seeds. They're still inside of there. The only way that we know what's in this bag is because every so often, a little seed will make its way out of one of the bug holes on the side of the bag. Otherwise, it would have perfectly stored the seeds. So what we're seeing is actually women's innovations, not only in agriculture, but also in textile production because they're moving into a time where they're having to figure out how to store and transport these tiny seeded plant materials. And so they're changing their textile traditions to adjust to those needs. This is like one of the best examples I have of this. We did actually relatively recently put this little bag through a micro CT scanner at the University of Arkansas. So we have thousands of micro CT scan slices of it, um, but we're still processing the data to kind of um, help us understand, but it really is full of nothing but seeds. There's nothing in there but a liter of seed. It's pretty incredible. Some of the other things that studying textiles can help us say is a little bit about sort of human activities and human lives and the ways in which people are structuring their lives. For years, most archaeologists in the southeast have talked about feather robes and feather textiles as being a function of elite status, that when we would see feather materials, which we do occasionally see at sites like Etowah and elsewhere, that that had to do with chiefdoms, that had to do with big man structures of society, which, you know, so you had people 
making these incredible luxury goods for a political elite or a social elite. When I started looking at some of the textiles in the Ozark Plateau, things were starting to look a little different. Um, and in particular, I saw, actually I should have said this earlier and I didn't. I'll roll back and say something about this. Um, you have a unique, rare opportunity to be actually looking at some burial materials here. We don't normally show them. And you'll notice that I'm just showing a little scrap that comes from one of the bluff shelters. Um, these are very sensitive materials to be studying, but they do help us learn enormous amounts about humanity. And so in this case, in going back and looking at these Ozark Plateau textiles, I, I just did a simple thing of kind of mapping out like where across Arkansas these feather robes are found and who are they found with. And it, I did it not by looking at the actual textiles themselves, but just by looking at our field records that we have for these excavations. And there's a very interesting phenomenon that sort of pops up. First of all, all of the feather robes in the Ozark Plateau appear to be woodland. So they're relatively early. They're anywhere between 1,500, possibly 2,000 years old. So they're, they're pretty early textile. And what they're doing is they're wrapping these really fine downy feathers around a cordage core and then making a robe um, or a little sort of textile with that. And when you look at who they're with, they are predominantly with women and children. In fact, there's only one that is with a person that we're not entirely sure what the gender is, but it's because it's probably a pre-adolescent child. And so pre-adolescent children are difficult to sex. We're not, it's not so easy to figure out what sex they are. So we're looking at a textile that's really pretty much just found in the burials of women and children, and oftentimes with infants themselves. So infants normally don't have elite status. <laughs> The only way you have infants with elite status is when you have infants being born in social systems where we have things like monarchies and you know, stratified social societies where there are families who have hereditary elite status. That's not a form of society that we think about for the woodland for the most part. These are relatively egalitarian societies. So what's the deal with one of the most sophisticated, difficult, gorgeous textiles being found mostly in the burials of infants. Well, what do we do today when we find out that a woman in the family is going to have a child? Oftentimes what you'll see is groups of women, grandma, aunts, sisters, will start making a receiving blanket. There's an actual textile made to acknowledge the entry of that new little person into the family unit. And I suspect that what we're seeing in the Ozark Plateau in the woodland period is a textile that is being made as a part of the entry of these new little people into a society. So we're seeing really, really sophisticated textiles being made predominantly for women and children. As we come through time and we get into what we consider the Mississippian period, uh, so the late prehistoric period about a thousand year, years ago, all the way up to the start of European colonialism, we see some really interesting things happening with textile production. They become a lot fancier for starters. We start to see a lot more really elaborate textiles being produced. But we also see a shift in the kinds of fibers being used. Gone is all of that pawpaw bast fiber. And what they're mostly using at this point are things like milkweed and dogbane and nettle, these much finer fibers. Um, and they produce these really beautiful um, white textiles, too. And we're starting to see a lot more complexity in the weaves. This is a really famous one. Um, it's a fragment of a textile from Spiral Mounds in Oklahoma, but there's a couple of examples from across the southeast that match that. And it is essentially what we know in European textile production as bobbin lace. So it's this really complicated, very delicate weaving um, technique that's used to produce these um, motifs woven into the surface of the textile. Also, oddly enough, we actually have an example of crochet <laughs> from the Ozark Plateau. And it has a really late date. Um, it's, it's got a like 1500 to 1600 AD date. So this actually might be a contact period textile. 
And it's hard to know if we just don't have other examples of crochet from earlier, or if what we're seeing here is an indigenous weaver using indigenous fibers, but a European technique. It's an interesting issue here. When we come in the Mississippian period, though, we also get something really incredible, and that's people depicting themselves in really intricate ways. And so for the first time, we can begin to match the textiles being produced with the art that people are producing as well, or one of the other forms of art they're producing. One of the best examples of this is what I call the Mississippian bag. So there's a very specific type of bag being woven in this period, and it has a very distinctive um, finish across the top of the bag. They're taking the warps and they're twisting them up and then catching them up in a braid that goes around the top. And it makes this very identifiable little set of sort of thick elements that come off the top of the bag. We see in, Oklahoma, or, uh, in Arkansas, Tennessee, Illinois, another example from Arkansas. But then when you look at some of the carved effigies, there it is, there's the bag. And it's been carved so perfectly and so lovingly on the back of this female figurine that it is immediately identifiable because there are the little warps gathered up in the top of the bag. We have some other really interesting examples too. Um, the two textiles being shown come from Spiro Mounds in Oklahoma, which has this incredible assemblage of clothing and, and basketry um, that's preserved in one great big assemblage. But what we're also seeing is people depicting their own clothing. So we have examples like the Thurston tablet, where you can see the figures wearing these little wrap skirts with a dot and circle motif. Well, there it is. There's the wrap skirt with the dot and circle motif. This, although the black and white image is the only one I have for this sadly right now, um, this is actually red with yellow uh, dot and circle. It's some form of either tie-dye or batik is how they've made the, the motif pattern across this skirt. And it's not the only example of this. We have a few others as well. The kneeling effigy, the female effigy also from Tennessee, painted across her is actually one of these dyed or woven textiles that we're seeing in the archaeological record. So we're seeing people actually depicting their own textiles on themselves in this example here. We also get some of these early European accounts though too, excuse me, <coughs> the Arkansas allergy. Contrary to what becomes a later popular image of native peoples as dressed in nothing but leather, you know, a wrap around leather skirt um, or a leather dress, when you read some of the earliest of European accounts, they're actually talking about how incredibly beautiful the textiles are. They're talking about <clears throat> these woven textiles that we see in the archaeological record. And in fact, <clears throat> if you are a complete nerd like I am, I have actually gone through the Soto Chronicles, the accounts of DeSoto across the southeast, um, and made an Excel file of all of the things that the Spanish ever stole from indigenous peoples as they came across the, the southeast United States. And while most people know that the Spanish were stealing a lot of food from indigenous villages, they were also stealing an enormous amount of cloth. And if you think about it, <laughs> which apparently the Spanish did not bother to think about because they didn't really bring any cloth with them. They brought lots of other things, plenty of weaponry and some trade beads, um, but they didn't really bring a whole lot of cloth. So hiking across the southeast in the summertime, <laughs> they would have been in rags by the time they got a state through, you know, greenbrier and swamps and all sorts of things. So they were actually stealing cloth from indigenous villages in order to have clothing. And they'll even talk about women wearing mantles as fine as muslin. So that gives you an idea of the fact that, you know, what Europeans were seeing in the 15 and 1600s was the production of really nice cloth that people are using for a variety of purposes. You have a description here of de Prats um, talking about Natchez women wearing wrapped skirts and wrapped mantles. And we can see that as well in the earlier iconography of people wearing the wrapped skirts and the wrapped mantles. Let me go back a second though. I mentioned the bunny earlier. <laughs> um, I've never seen this textile, I've never had a chance to analyze it, it's the Smithsonian, but I have done the analysis of this one, 
And a whole bunch of the fiber used to make that textile is actually rabbit fur. It's spun and dyed rabbit fur. And there is an enormous amount of spun and dyed rabbit fur in the spiral mounds assemblage. It's really incredible stuff. Um, this is another example of a spun and dyed rabbit fur textile. These are a type of um, textile known as tapestry. The only um, modern equivalent in indigenous weaving actually comes from the Pacific Northwest coast. So it's not a cultural relationship. It just happens to be that two sets of people came up with the same technique not uncommon in, in the past. Um, but what they're doing is they're twining these textiles in little discrete color blocks. And they're doing both um, horizontal and vertical twining as well as sometimes diagonal twining to make these incredibly complicated textiles. Most of the tapestry textiles from the Spiral Mounds collection are iconographic. They're actually depicting images of mythic beings. Um, so we have some of the same images that are being carved into shell gorgets and shell cups, as well as being put on embossed copper plates, also being woven into the surfaces of textiles. And this is an immensely complicated um, technique that people are doing. We also see some of these examples of feather robes. And here is a point at which we probably are seeing the use of feather robes by elite, by elite persons. So we have the same type of basic textile, but their role in society has changed through time. They've gone from being a woodland period textile associated with infants and women to something that's associated more with kind of religious and ceremonial practices. But again, when we look at some of the early European accounts, they're saying straight out just how pretty the cloth is. They're, they're seeing um, these amazing textiles that people are wearing and also storing in the villages. And I'll, I'll note here um, when you read this passage translated into English, there's a mistranslation in there. Um, they talk about feather mantles being white, gray, vermilion, and yellow. The gray in the passage is a mistranslation. It should say green. So white, green, yellow, red, black. One of the kind of fascinating things about this particular piece is that the, this funny little color, this kind of tinny, mousy brown color, it's the color that green often fades to. So green dyes are frequently not fast dyes. They'll fade through time. And I suspect that the little um, kind of nondescript brown in this textile probably was once a very brilliant green color. This is my last slide, but I want to talk a little bit about persistence of traditions. Um, one of the things that's really incredible when we look at river cane basketry across the southeast, we know that today we see river cane basketry being produced by Cherokee and Choctaw and Creek, Chimacha, Seminole. Almost all of the southeastern indigenous um, tribes and nations have weavers doing river cane basketry. It is an ancient, ancient art form. These folks have been we weaving these river cane baskets for at least uh, seven or 8,000 years. One of the most interesting things about looking at river cane basketry in the southeast is that when we get a good handle on the array of basketry that we have, not only is the technique itself seven or 8,000 years old, but we're seeing thousands of year old use of motifs. So we have a motif that is used in contemporary basketry. It's, it is a really prominent in Chittimacha basketry from Louisiana. They refer to it as alligator guts. And it's this linked, interlinked spiral motif. Well, we can track it through time. It is almost 2,000 years old. It is the same motif on this little basket from the Ozark Plateau with a date of AD 545 as we see on a basket woven in 1970. So these are deeply, deeply persistent traditions. So when you're looking at river cane basketry produced by Cherokee and Choctaw and Creek and others, you're looking at an art form that has been passed down despite the enormous damage done to societies by colonialism for thousands of years. And that's my thanks. Anybody have any questions?